Raising kids is hard, y'all. Thank you. There are a lot of amens internally there too. Uh, we are in the stage of parenting that it feels like every stage of parenting uh, gets easier and harder at the same time. Uh, so with a six-year-old, a four-year-old, and an almost two-year-old, we're in a stage right now where we are trying our best to set good rules for the lumpy household. Uh, we wanna make sure that these rules are not overly strict, but strict enough that they kind of protect themselves from themselves. And so we're, we're in the stage right now where, where we're setting rules and we're getting kind of a good rhythm at that. But one of the challenges that we were not expecting uh, was that when those rules come back to bite us. So what we've learned in this stage of parenting is that if we are going to make rules for our children, then we had better be ready to abide by them ourselves. We have a rule in our house. It's not a, a revolutionary rule. You probably have the same rule at your house growing up that if you're going to have dessert, you've got to Clean your plate. And that's a good rule, and they abide by that. And then um, if I leave even as much as one Brussels sprout on my plate and reach for the Oreos, because it's never one, my six-year-old's going to let me hear about it. Dad, we have a rule. You got to clean your plate. We have a rule in our house that we're trying to our best to live by that uh, we say there's no screens after 6 p.m. So we are old souls. We eat dinner about 5.30. And then after dinner, there's no more screens. There's no cartoons. There's no Kindles. You go upstairs and you play. And we're pretty good about that. But a couple of weeks ago, we sent the girls upstairs. They were playing in the playroom, not watching screens. And then once again, the six-year-old comes down. And what does she find? She finds mom and dad sitting on the couch watching a show on Netflix. And you had better believe that she reminded us of this rule. Mom, dad, there's no screens after 6 p.m. We also have speech codes in our house. Trying to help our kids to not say things that they shouldn't say. And so there are some words that are off limit in the lumpy household. The S word is off limits. You know the S word, right? Stupid, right? We don't say that. Uh, the D word is also off limits. You know the D word, dumb. But one that they catch us slipping on quite a bit, far too often than I would like to admit, is the H word, hate. See, we say we don't say that in the lumpy household. Instead, we're teaching them to be creative with their synonyms. So if they are tempted to say that they hate something, instead they will say they abhor it. They don't hate something, they loathe it. They really, really, really don't like that. And so I tell you that to say this, that if my six-year-old were in the room right now, she would not be happy about the title of this message. Because the title of this message in this installment of clickbait, we're looking at things that sound Christian and asking the question, is it true? Is that we should love the sinner and hate the sin. Love the sinner, hate the sin. I would get in trouble for saying that. But I tell you, as I was preparing this message, I thought surely there's a, a little bit of a way around this. Because I don't know about you, but I played this game in middle school, kind of grown up in youth group, that we realized that there were some bad words, worse than the ones we're teaching our kids not to say. There were some bad words, but we kind of figured, you know what? If that bad word is in the Bible, then we can say it, Right? There's a certain synonym for a donkey that is in the Bible. And we thought, surely we can say that. There's another one, a place that some people go. If they don't go to heaven, they go somewhere else. And that's in the Bible. So surely we can say that word too, right? And so you may be thinking this sentiment, this idea, love the sinner, hate the sin. Surely that would be within bounds because that's in the Bible. You may even be tempted to say, well, I, I'm pretty sure Jesus said that, so you should be able to say that as well. And what I want to tell you today is that love the sinner, hate the sin is not found in our Bibles. 
Old Testament, not there. New Testament, not there. Words of Jesus, not there. In fact, the earliest account of this kind of idea goes back to the fourth century to St. Augustine, one of the church fathers, where he said that his followers, his disciples, should have a love for humankind and a hatred for sin. And so if it's not in the Bible, if it didn't come from the word of Jesus, then is it true? Is it something that we should adopt to love the sinner and to hate the sin? Here's the big idea that I wanna get through this morning. Is that as we think about how to treat people that we love, that do things we believe are sinful, the lens by which you view other people must be the same lens by which you view yourself. The lens, the way you think about, the way you process somebody else and their sin must be the same lens, the same way you process your own sin. Because really this idea of loving the sinner and hating the sin, um, I know that this is a live option for so many of us in this room. Chances are all of us have somebody in our life, a family member, a friend, a coworker, and you love them deeply, you want what's best for them, but you see the way that they are living their lives. You see the choices that they are making. You see the things that they're posting on social media and you know that they are living a life of sin. And so it brings this question, how can we love that person? What does it mean to love that person when we know that what they're doing is killing their bodies and killing their souls? This is a real option. And so it's an important thing for us to talk about. And to do it, to kind of frame our conversation, I wanna look at a famous passage uh, from Matthew's gospel in chapter 22. If you have any background in church, you've heard this multiple times before, but Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 34. It says, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. They got a scheme and one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. And he said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And a second one, listen to this, is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's the lens. On these two commandments depend all of the law and all of the prophets. Okay, so let's, let's talk about what's happening here. The, the Pharisees, they're, they're the religious elite of the day. They know all the laws of the Old Testament and they, they live by them. And so they kind of want to trap Jesus. And so they walk to Jesus, Jesus, 613 laws, which one's the most important? If you're preaching this new way of living through you, then what should we listen to? And what can we kind of disregard? And Jesus, as he always does, sidesteps the question. And he says, really, all of the law, all the prophets, all the Old Testament, it boils down to two things, love God and love your neighbor. It's that simple. I tell you, sometimes I, I think that I, I'm guilty of this, uh, that we overcomplicate the Christian faith. We talk about all the things that you should do and all the fun things that you shouldn't do. And you may be wondering, what does it actually mean to live as a Christian in the world? And Jesus makes it very simple. He says, love God and love people. And if you will do those two things, then you will abide by the laws of the Bible. Now, this same story, uh, very similar one, appears also in Luke chapter 10. Uh, same kind of thing. Pharisees come up, Jesus, what's the most important law? He says two things. He says, love God and love your neighbor. But there's a follow-up question there in Luke 10. One of the Pharisees asks a good question. He says, well, if I'm supposed to love God and love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? Very good question. Jesus goes on to tell the parable of the good Samaritan to kind of say that it's everybody. It's not just people that look like you or think like you or act like you. Treat the world, treat everybody, not just the people who live next door to you as your neighbor. It's a good question, who is my neighbor? But I think the modern question, if we were to have Jesus in front of us and he said, love God and love your neighbor, I think the real modern question we might ask today is what does it actually mean to love? If we're called to love our neighbor, what does that look like? In our current cultural conversation, there's really kind of one of two options. Uh, one of those options says to really love somebody, you have to endorse and support everything they do. Uh, there can be no uh, gentle guiding in the right direction. There can be no disagreement about their lifestyle. To love is to fully accept and fully support. 
And a lot of people hear that and they think, I, I can't get on board with that with a lot of stuff. And so what do we run to? We run to the opposite end, option number two, which is outrage, which is hatred. We say, I can't love you like that, so instead I'm gonna get a little judgy and a little self-righteous and I'm gonna condemn you. Listen, we see this all over the place. Outrage is everywhere. Uh, back in 2018, Lance Morrow, who's a, uh, an essayist for Time Magazine, he wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal. And the title of the article was this, America is addicted to outrage. Is there a cure? And Morrow goes on to argue that that's exactly true, that outrage is everywhere. The opening sentence of the article says that outrage has become the signature emotion of American public life. Instead of love and forgiveness, the way Jesus taught us to live, we get outraged. And it's so easy. He talks about the advent of social media. Now we can hide behind our screens and how everything we see on our TV screens and in the news, it's designed to make us outraged. I watched a lot of news this week and every time I got outraged at somebody or something. But then Morrow asked this question, why is that our first response? Why do we run to anger, to hatred, to outrage? And here's what he said, here's the why. He said, people give themselves over to the pleasures of self-righteousness and self-importance that come with being wronged when you know that you're in the right. Among the civic emotions, outrage is a beat of the prime. To harness outrage is to discover fire. It seems like our only two options in the modern world are either to love and fully accept and support or outrage, but there must be a third way. And what I wanna argue this morning is that the third way is the way of Jesus, to view other people with the same lens by which we view ourselves. Let me tell you, this is a lot easier said than done, especially when it's somebody that you really love. So here's what I wanna do today. I wanna give you three big ideas. And I want you to think about that person in your life that sometimes it's hard to love because of the sins that they commit. And let me go and tell you here, I'm not gonna teach you biblically about how to have those hard conversations about their sins. There's a time and there may be a place for that, but that's kind of a one-on-one conversation, not a monologue. Uh, Billy Graham was once quoted as saying this. He, he said, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's God's job to judge. And it's our job to love. So what does it look like to love someone who is living within their sin? Three big ideas. The first one is this. Label people based on who they are in Christ, not by how they choose to sin. When you think about somebody, when you label them in your mind, because we all kind of rush to that, label them not by their particular sin, but instead label them by who they are in Christ. See, here's what we believe as Wesleyan Christians. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for everybody. Think of the deepest, darkest sinner in your mind. Jesus Christ loved them as much as he loves you. There's some theological traditions that say that Jesus only died for a certain special group of elect people. We don't believe that. We believe that Jesus Christ died for all, which means that when you look at somebody, even in their sin, you see somebody for whom Jesus Christ died. You see someone for whom is made in the image of God. You see someone who needs just as much grace each and every day as you do. Label somebody, not by how they choose to sin, but instead of the fact that they are beloved by Jesus Christ. Jesus teaches on this tendency we have towards self-righteousness and judgment to label people as dirtier, darker sinners than we are in Matthew chapter seven, verse one. Here's what he says. He says, judge not that you might not be judged. For with the same judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. You see that lens. And with the measure you use, it will be measured against you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how, excuse me, how can you say to a brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when it's the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. See what Jesus is saying here. We rush to judgment about how somebody sins. 
But he says, before you label them a sinner, realize that there is a speck in your own eye that is marring your judgment and marring your viewpoint against them. We shouldn't just label blanket people by how they choose to sin. Think about it this way. Um, let's say you show up to church next week <clears throat> and right out here, uh, we've, got a, we've got a table with, with name tags. And I encourage you to, to fill out that name tag, but not with your name, with your deepest, darkest sin. Uh-huh. Y'all make me mad enough, I'm gonna make you do this one day, okay? So, so that way, when you walk in, you're not David or Delilah. You are adulterer or gossiper. You're not John and you're not Joni. You are a thief, you are a liar. That'd be absurd, right? We would never encourage you to do that. Because then on the front of your shirt, you are labeled by your worst quality. So if we don't do that for ourselves, then why is it so easy to do it for other people? Remember, the lens by which you view them must be the same lens by which you view yourself. Listen to this. One of the main reasons why love the sinner, hate the sin is at best only a half truth is this. Jesus doesn't say love the sinner. What does he say? He says, love your neighbor. Don't look at somebody and just see their sins. See them as a neighbor for whom Christ died for. That's number one. Be careful about your labels. Number two, give the same compassion that you give to yourself to somebody else. Give the same compassion to somebody who is wandering in the wilderness of sin that you would give to yourself. There's this uh, phenomenon in psychology called the fundamental attribution error. What the fundamental attribution error says is that it's natural human nature that we label other people in their wrongness as a character flaw, whereas if we were to do the same thing, we would say it's situational. We see somebody commit something, uh, some kind of sin, something really bad, and we think, well, they must just be a bad person. But if we were to do the same thing, we come up with a laundry list of excuses. I, 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 was, I was tired. My family's always done it this way. It was just one time I was hangry. You can make many, many excuses for why you would do the same thing and you attribute yourself to situations and somebody else to their character. But instead, we need to give the same compassion to others that we give to ourselves. And part of that is realizing that even though their sin may be different than yours, you are still a sinner. And you can still love yourself. In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis was kind of processing through this idea, how can we love somebody while hating what they do? And here's what he wrote. He said, I remember Christian teachers telling me long ago that I must hate a bad man's actions, but not hate the bad man. Or as they would say, hate the sin, but not the sinner. I used to think this was a silly straw splitting distinction. How could you hate what a man did and not hate the man? But years later, it occurred to me that there was one man to whom I had been doing this all my life, namely myself. However much I might dislike my own cowardice or conceit or greed, I went on loving myself. There had never been the slightest difficulty about it. In fact, the very reason why I hated the things that I did was that I loved the man. Just because I loved myself, I was sorry to find that I was the sort of man who did those things. We give a lot of compassion. We give a lot of love to ourselves. What I'm asking you to do is to give the same compassion and the same love to somebody else because you don't know what they're going through. When you see somebody even living in their sin, we try to piece together the ideas. We try to put the puzzle together in our mind where why they would make those decisions. But ultimately, you don't know. Only God does. Um, so if you're kind of new to our church, we do things differently uh, in a lot of ways here at the Woodlands Methodist Church. Uh, we are one church with a lot of different uh, communities, a lot of different expressions and many campuses as well. So we have uh, loft, we have harvest, we have traditional, we have chapel, we have uh, a Spanish service, all of those meeting on this campus. We also have a, a Chinese church that's using our facilities on Sunday morning as well. Uh, that's here at the Woodlands campus. And then we have a campus in Montgomery and a campus in Wood Forest. And uh, if you haven't been out to either of those campuses, I highly encourage you to take a Sunday. Uh, they're part of our family 
family, and so go visit them. And what you'll find if you ever go out to visit Wood Forest is that Pastor Brent Parker has ended every service in the same way. This is their mantra. This is their benediction. This is what they recite together at the end of every service. Here's what they say. They say, remember to be kind and gentle, thoughtful and gracious. Listen, for we do not know the burdens other may bear in their hearts, in their minds, or in their bodies. We are the body of Christ. That's how they end every service as a reminder of saying, you don't know what somebody else is going through. And you may never know the struggles that they bear. So we need to be thoughtful and kind and gentle and loving in all the ways that we can be. We need to give them the same compassion that we would give ourselves. Last thing is this, number three. How can we love somebody while still despising what's killing them? This one's a hard one. Celebrate the small steps. Celebrate the small steps. It can be so easy when somebody is living a life of sin that they may begin to just break out a tiny, tiny bit and then it can be easy to say, you're a fraud. I see how you're really living your life and now I see you're trying to sprinkle over some spirituality of it. You are wrong, you are bad. You need to completely turn your life around. But instead, what I wanna encourage you to do is celebrate the small steps before you start piling on. Uh, we saw this this very week. So uh, some of you might know the name Russell Brand. Um, hasn't exactly lived, and he would be willing to admit this, the, the most holy and perfect life, British guy. Uh, comedian, foul mouthed, you name it, he's done it multiple times. Uh, you may not know that this week, Russell Brand is getting baptized. And so he posted this video about the transformation that he's undergone and how he's, he's gonna take the plunge is what he said and be baptized to new life in Christ. And I watched this video and I said, praise God. Praise God that a prodigal son has come back home. What a witness he is going to be. This is amazing. And then I made the mistake of reading the comments. <laughs> Never read the comments. Because after... After he posted that immediately, one after another, after another, people, devout, uh, professing Christians said, you're wrong. You, you don't know what baptism is. You're not using the right language. Do so you realize now that if you get baptized, you have to do all this other stuff? They began piling on him when all along, I think we should be celebrating that small step. Amen. Is he gonna mess up again? Absolutely, but so are you. I heard a story this week about uh, a young woman named Stephanie. And I'll get some of the details wrong, but this is kind of the general uh, idea of Stephanie. So Stephanie was born into a Roman Catholic family. Uh, and her family, they were devout Catholics. And so they brought Stephanie to mass uh, virtually every weekend when she was growing up. They uh, took her education seriously. And so they enrolled her uh, in private Catholic schools as well. And so from an early age, Stephanie knew God. She knew Jesus. She knew the traditions of the church and she was walking out her faith as best she could. Uh, and then a, a story, unfortunately, is old as time. Uh, Stephanie leaves the house and begins uh, to go to school and take off in her career. And, and as she's away from home and as she's taking off in her industry, um, she turns her back on her faith. And suddenly the, the going to mass ended, the, the praying, the scripture reading, all that ended. And she began to really live a life of sin. But as she was kind of rising up in her industry, she was a really fast riser. Uh, she had an older gentleman who was a part of the, the same industry who, who kind of took her under his wing to kind of mentor. And his name was Tony. And what Tony told Stephanie was, hey, hey, when, when you're rising up, don't forget what, what brought you there. You, you need to... To, to rekindle your faith. And so Tony invited Stephanie to mass. And sure enough, week after week, uh, Stephanie would come with Tony to mass. And then uh, for a while there, Tony was traveling and so he couldn't go. And so Stephanie went by herself. It was about 10 years ago or so, she started posting on her social media uh, the things that she was learning in church, started posting Bible verses, starting posting prayer And again, the comments, it's always the comments. The comments were horrendous. They said, I've seen how you live your life. You, you, you live it on social media and we see the bad things that you do. We see the bad things that you say. We see even the way you treat people. How dare you now try to redeem yourself by saying that you're going to church and posting these Bible verses? How dare you? 
Listen to me, could you imagine the joy in her parents' heart when their child who had a great foundation went off and then begins taking a small step back? Can you imagine the celebration that they must have had? Here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to have that kind of celebration in your heart, even if it isn't your child. Now, here's what's interesting. Um, you, you know who Stephanie is. Um, and this doesn't really change the substance of the story, but it makes it interesting. Uh, Stephanie is Lady Gaga. And so this is not an endorsement. I, I don't listen to Lady Gaga's music. I don't know what she's like. But, but here's what I am saying. We need to celebrate that that older mentor, who you also know, Tony Bennett, invited her to church, and she got back a little bit on the right path. Celebrate the small steps. What does that look like for you? A, a child who is wayward living a life of sin, living a life that you never imagined. Celebrate if you get them to church on Christmas Eve. A, a coworker who you know has no relationship with God and really no desire for God and maybe a little bit hostile towards God. If that coworker ever asks you to pray for them, celebrate the small steps. A friend who you've seen the way their lifestyle is sinful begins to ask you just little basic questions about the faith, celebrate the small steps. Give them the same compassion that you would give yourself. It may not be the full step, but I believe that every time a prodigal son, a prodigal daughter turns back home and takes that first step back to the father, all of heaven rejoices and we need to join alongside of that. See, at the end of the day, I believe that you could love your neighbor and still loathe their sin because you've received that treatment from God. As I was researching this week for this message, I, I looked at a lot of uh, what very prominent pastors had to say about this statement. And, and I listened to a lot of podcasts and watched a lot of sermons. And let me tell you, I, I was a little taken aback because I thought that I might be wrong. It never happens, ask my wife, but I thought <laughs> maybe I might be wrong because here's what they all said. They all said, God doesn't love the sinner and hate the sin. They said, God hates the sinner. They said, Jesus didn't die for your sin. Jesus died for sinners. They said that your sins do not go to hell. Your body, yourself goes to hell. So how can we say that Jesus loves the sinner? And I listened to that and I thought, that seems really weird to me. Like I hope God doesn't hate the sinner because I'm one of them. And they quoted some obscure passages from the Old Testament. A couple of Psalms were in all these sermons about God having hatred for the wicked. I thought, man, that's really compelling. And then I remembered um, another obscure verse in the New Testament, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. I, I thought about Romans 5, 8, where Paul says that this is how we know what love is, that while we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. While we were still sinners, Jesus showed his love for us by going to a cross for you and for me. And let me tell you this, nobody dies for somebody they hate. Jesus died because he loves you that much, even in your sin. So when Jesus says the call of the Christians is to love God and to love your neighbor the way that we love our neighbor, the way Jesus Christ loves us. Let me pray for us, Law family. Gracious God, we do thank you for the love that we see in Jesus Christ, the love that was poured out on Calvary's hill. God, help us, even though it is so, so difficult at times to show that same love to others. God, I know that in this room right now, 
We have a lot of faces, we have a lot of names in our minds, somebody that we love deeply, a family member, a friend, a coworker, a neighbor, that we love so much, but we see the way that they're living in sin. God, first I wanna pray for that person. Pray that the Holy Spirit would convict them of the way that they're living and show them the way of life. God, I pray that they might start asking questions, seeking deep spiritual things. God, lead them to your cross and to your empty tomb. But God, secondly, I wanna pray for all of us. That you'll teach us, that you'll show us, that you'll guide us in how to love them well to show compassion, to show forgiveness, to show correction when and if the time presents itself. God, help us as a community to go out and to live the way that Jesus has called us to live, to be a light on a hill. So that your name might be glorified. God, help us especially when it's hard to love our neighbor and to load the sin. And we thank you that we can pray that through the precious blood of Jesus Christ.